So in this video today, we're going to find the lost Shemitah years, the lost sabbatical cycles of Daniel chapter 9. One of the things that I really appreciate about living in the time that I'm living in right now, um, and I believe it's the end times, is that there has been so much that's come to light about Jewishness, about what it means to be Jewish, about the Hebrew scriptures, about the feast days and the festivals, about the Maseroth, about the Shemitah years, about Jubilees, about all this kind of stuff that normally most Christians throughout history have not focused on at all. So when the Catholic Church came into being, a kind of divorce between the Hebrew roots of of Christianity and an influx of pagan influence, especially uh, Greek philosophy and kind of a rational mindset. But what had happened really was tragic that so much of the Jewishness of Christianity was lost. The Jewish roots, the festivals, the feast days, the um, the idea of a Jubilee and the, the Shemitah years and the year of release, okay, the seventh year, the sabbatical year year when the land was to lie fallow. Uh, so much was lost and so much of um, Israel's history, the, the historical writings that are in the Old Testament is basically unknown by most Christians. Most Christians could not give you a history of the nation of Israel, you know, from the creation up through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, going down into Egypt, coming out of Egypt with Moses, then going uh, in the wilderness for 40 years, going into the promised land with Joshua. Um, we have the the period of the judges, actually, and the Samuel, and then we have the tabernacle of Moses being set up, the ark leaving the tabernacle, the tabernacle of David being set up, King Saul, David, Solomon, Solomon's temple, other kings that came along, a divided kingdom, uh, the northern ten tribes, the southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin, the Assyrians coming in and taking out the ten northern tribes, and finally uh, Judah being taken into Babylonian captivity by Nebuchadnezzar. They're in Babylon for 70 years, then they come back into the land again, and they rebuild the second temple, we have a few hundred years, then we have the coming of the Messiah, we have the birth of Christ. So there's uh, a lot of Old Testament prophets who are prophesying mostly around the time of the Babylonian captivity, just prior to that. And the reason for the Babylonian captivity, in addition um, to all the idol worship and all the paganism, the, the terrible things that the Jews had been doing, thinking God would not see what was going on. God sent them into captivity in Babylon, not for their undoing, but so that they would be remorseful and repentant and come back to him in a, in a true and righteous kind of way. Well, the Babylonian captivity lasted for 70 years. And the question is why? Why 70 years? Well, we learn that they were in captivity in Babylon one year for every year that they didn't keep the sabbatical year. That is, every seventh year they were supposed to let the land rest. Have six years where they worked the soil, and then on the seventh year they let the land rest, and then in the eighth year they could plant the crops again. So there's 490 years prior to the Babylonian captivity. And then the angel Gabriel comes to Daniel and says there's going to be another 490 years at the end of which Israel will have come to their senses. Their sins will be atoned for, iniquity will be covered, be able to seal up vision and prophecy and so on. So what the angel Gabriel gave Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 were actually 70 groups of Shemitah or Shabuah, 70 groups of seven years. Now, if you're a Jew, this is not just any random grouping of seven years. It's the Shemitah cycle. It's the, the cycle of, of planting, and it's tied to the agricultural system. And the Shemitah years, you begin the count in the month of Tishri, which is the seventh month on the Jewish calendar. 
So when we look at the 70 Shabua, or the 70 Shavua, however you want to say it, the 70 groups of seven sabbatical years, we're not looking at just any random group of years. This, these are groups of seven years that have to begin on a certain day. <laughs> okay, They start on Tishri 1, the seventh month of the Hebrew calendar. So here's the prophecy. I know I've done this many times, and, and really, I am praying. I am absolutely praying that one person, please, dear Lord, let one person come away with an aha moment here where they can actually grasp what is happening, what is happening in this prophecy and how on earth it is that this could be so messed up in today's day and age. How, how it is that we can't see this in light of all the Hebraic understanding that we've acquired over the last 30 years or so. So here's the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. 70 weeks, that is 70 sevens or 70 Shavuas are decreed for your people and for your holy city to stop their transgression, to put an end to sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know and understand this. From the issuance of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. Okay, from the issuance of the decree until Messiah the Prince, there would be seven weeks of years and 62 weeks of years. Seven Shavuas, okay, 49 years, and 62 Shavuas. That is, there's going to be 70 sevens plus 62 sevens, or 483 years until Messiah the Prince. 483 years, and then we'll have Messiah the Prince. 483 sabbatical years from the time the decree is issued until Messiah comes. The prophecy of Daniel's 70 sevens directs us to a very, very specific group of years. The 77s, or the 70 Shavuas, represent 70 sabbatical cycles. Okay, 70 sabbatical cycles. Okay, so the following is a rather lengthy and scholarly quotation, but it expresses the problem with the current understanding of Daniel chapter 9. Okay, the current understanding for most people of Daniel chapter 9 is reflected in basically the work of Sir Robert Anderson and his book, The Coming Prince. And I've talked about this in other places before, that uh, Sir Robert Anderson uh, was in the late 1800s uh, when he wrote his book, The Coming Prince, which he uh, basically derived from Daniel 9 er erroneously. But he was one of the, the few scholarly people who actually believed in a literal interpretation of scriptures, especially a literal interpretation of the book of Daniel. And he lived in a time in an era when so much of this was allegorized or it was, you know, swept under the rug that da the book of Daniel could not be true. It must have been written after the fact because it was so accurate and so on. Unfortunately, uh, Sir Robert Anderson, who was a um, was Scotland Yard, he was a, he was a brilliant man, but he didn't understand the Jewishness of this particular prophecy, because if he had understood that um, the sabbatical years, the seventy weeks of seven Shavuos of uh, sabbatical years, Shemitah years, if he'd understood that a Shemitah year must begin on Tishri 1, he wouldn't have calculated the coming of the Messiah the way he did. Okay, he calculated it from the actual decree, which was in the spring. He uh, calculated it from that date. Now, there was somebody who came after him who did some kind of convoluted thing with um, uh, prophetic days of 360 year days and then did some other um, shuffling of days and stuff around and ended up with supposedly the coming of the Messiah 
on Palm Sunday, okay, on his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, okay, and so all of that seemed really marvelous. It seemed to fit the picture of, you know, Jesus' arrival, that that's when he came as king. He had that anointing or whatever. Unfortunately, it's not correct. That is not correct, and I'm going to pull the rug out from underneath that, and, and it's not just me, okay? I'm going to quote from scholarly people, people who made this their life's work to understand what this means in the context of the time of Daniel, plus how people in, in Christ's day would have understood this. And that's really important because they needed to know when their Messiah would come. And they had to get the count right. They had to know when actually to begin the count. Was it at the time of the decree when it went out? Or was it when the Jews actually were in the land in Judea in Jerusalem, and then that very first Tishri one was when they would begin their sabbatical count of the Shemitah years. So I'm going to just read excerpts from this article that is from BibleArchaeology.org. I'll leave a link for this in the description box if you want to read the whole article. It's um, basically, it's, thir it's 35 pages for part one, but it, and it's very scholarly. Some of you may find that it's pretty dry, but if anybody who is really interested in this wants to understand the problem with the typical seven-year tribulation coming from the 70th week of Daniel, uh, issue, if you really want to understand what the, what the problem is, I invite you to read that. And I'm just going to give you the layman's um, synopsis of this, so hopefully it's not too dry or too boring. So the sets of seven years are readily seen as a synonym for sabbatical year cycles. The term Shavua has a direct connection to the regular seven-year periods from one sabbatical year to the next. And if this is indeed the case, then what Daniel 9.25 says can be paraphrased thusly, basically following the New International Version. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until an anointed one, a ruler comes, there will be seven sabbatical year cycles plus 62 sabbatical year cycles. Seven sabbatical year cycles equals one jubilee. The following year would be the jubilee year, and that would be inclusive in the beginning of the next cycle. Plus 62 sabbatical years cycles. Okay, so 62 times seven would give you 434 years. If you add these two up, until Messiah the Prince, it's 483 sabbatical years beginning when the typical Shemitah cycle starts on Tishri 1, after the decree. You have the decree, you have them going into the land, and that as soon as that first uh, Tishri 1, the seventh month, hits, you begin the count. Understanding the weeks of Daniel 9 as sabbatical year cycles that had specific start and end dates. Therefore, we cannot begin counting multiples of seven years beginning from whatever date Artaxerxes may have first published his decree. You can't have any septennial number because agricultural years were always reckoned as beginning in the fall in the month of Tishri. The counting must commence with Tishri 1 of some year, in accordance with Mishnah Rosh Hashanah uh, 1a, on the first of Tishri is the new year for the Shemitah, the sabbatical year, and the Jubilee count. Even if Artaxerxes' decree that sent Ezra to Jerusalem in late March uh, the month of Nisan, in 457 B.C. was published in, say, January or February of 457 B.C., we must still wait until at least Tishri 1, 457 B.C., for the agricultural-based year to get underway. Then uh, wait until the following Tishri 1, 456 B.C., before we can count the first sabbatical year cycle as being completed. The date the decree was issued is not simultaneous with the date 
sabbatical year counting was resumed. The issuing of the decree and the start of the sevens counting are separate matters, though closely related. We cannot take the March or, or Nissan date of Artaxerxes' decree and say that this, the Shemitah years begin in the spring. They don't begin in the spring. You have to wait until the following fall of Tishri 1. That's when the agricultural cycle begins. That's when the new year for the Shemitah or the sabbatical cycle and the Jubilee count begins. So, we should approach our study with an eye to relate the prophecy of Daniel 9, 24 to 27 to a sabbatical year calendar. Noting that the word until in Daniel 9, 25 stops the week's count right at the time the anointed one comes. And connecting this with our earlier conclusion that the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem was issued by Artaxerxes Longamanus in the winter of 458-457 BC, shortly before Ezra's departure, we should thus consider the possibility that the 69 sabbatical year cycles would completely pass between Tishri 1, 457 BC, and the coming, whatever form that might take, of the Anointed One, the Messiah. Okay, and we know that Christ... Uh, came in the fall. He came in the fall during the fall feasts in the seventh month. I have show notes here. I have a lot listed in the show notes. A lot of of scholarly work that I am quoting so that you can understand that we're not talking about just any random group of years that can start at any point in time. The Hebraic understanding is that the seventh year of this group of Shemitah years is the year of release and it's the year when you let the land rest. And it has to start in the fall with the agricultural cycle. And there are a lot of passages that talk about this. Exodus 21, 2, Deuteronomy 15, 9, 12, and 18, Nehemiah 10, 31. In addition, the public reading of the law coincided with the beginning of the last year of every seven. Okay, so if then <laughs> Tishri 1, 444 marked the start of a sabbatical year, it follows that the preceding sabbatical year seven years earlier began on Tishri 1, 451 BC, and this means that the counting leading up to that seventh year had begun six years previously, Tishri 1, 457 BC, which, not coincidentally, was the earliest possible date sabbatical cycle counting could have started after Ezra's arrival. I, I don't know how else to say this except to say that you can't have a sabbatical cycle. You cannot have Shemitah years beginning any time because they're connected with the agricultural cycle which begins in the fall. Tishri 1. Okay, this is like the laws of the Medes and the Persians. This cannot be altered. So it doesn't matter when Artaxerxes issued his decree. If it was January, February, March, April, May, it doesn't matter. We don't start counting from when the decree was issued. We're counting 77s of years. We're counting sabbatical Shemitah years. <laughs> so they always begin on Tishri 1. So the decree would go out. Uh, Ezra and the group would come to Jerusalem, and as soon as that first Tishri 1 began, that's when the count would begin. What that means then is that the count begins in the fall. By the time you get to the end of the 69th week, or 483 years, you're going to be arriving in the fall, the, the next fall, the end of one goes right into the beginning of the fall of the next cycle. And we know that when Jesus came, he came during the fall feasts. The 70th week of Daniel is about Jesus. He came, okay? There would be seven weeks of years plus 62 weeks of years until Messiah the Prince. 483 sabbatical years. 
This would let the people of Israel know that when the Messiah showed up, he was going to show up in the fall. So when John the Baptist came and he starts preaching a baptism of repentance and all the people are going out to him, people say, are you the Messiah? They were not expecting their Messiah in April. They were expecting him in the fall. All right, so let's take a look at this next verse, Daniel 9, 26. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. Okay, he was going to be excommunicated, which basically is what cut off means. He's going to have nothing. That is, means he has no inheritance. He's actually, he's going to be killed. Now, this is where most people go, um, well, he comes at the end of the 69th week and then, and then he dies. Okay, he's cut off and he's cut off after the 69th week, but before the 70th week. And that's very artificial understanding of the scriptures. They're putting a gap in between the 69th and 70th week. And you don't have to do that. You can go directly into the 70th week. We know that the Messiah is going to be cut off after the 7 plus 62 weeks of years or 483 years at the end of 69 sabbatical years. The end of the 69th week would be the day before Tishri 1, and the beginning of the 70th week would then be on Tishri 1. Because sabbatical or Shemitah years are in view, we must stick to the correct calculation of the Shemitah year, and the Shemitah year would begin and end in the month of Tishri, or end in Elul and begin on Tishri 1. It cannot begin in the spring. It cannot begin in the summer or the winter. It cannot begin in any month except the month of Tishri, the seventh month. Okay, so now we come to the problem of the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And a lot of people go, well, that the people of the prince who is to come, the prince who is to come, that must be the Antichrist. Well, I'm going to... Uh, demonstrate actually from people who are pre-tribulation rapture people, people who are dispensationalists, that even by their understanding, that cannot be the case. The he who confirms the covenant is not the, the prince who is to come. Okay, let's look at this. Daniel 9, 26. Then the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. And until the end, there will be war. Desolations have been decreed. Now, we know that after um, Christ was put to death on the cross, that within about 40 years or so, a little less than that, that the Roman army came in and actually destroyed the city and the sanctuary. The Roman uh, army under Titus came in and destroyed the city and the sanctuary. Jesus prophesied this. Jesus actually was quoting from this passage when he told his disciples, you see these, the, these buildings, this temple, this is all going to be torn down. This prophecy here was basically prophesying that the Romans would come in and destroy the city and the sanctuary. The Roman prince was Titus. The army was Rome. Nobody, nobody contradicts this. We know that the Roman army under Titus was the ones who destroyed the city and the sanctuary after Christ was cut off. Okay, that is very plain. Now, even diehard dispensationalists, such as the man I'm going to quote from here, Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum, who was a Jewish uh, theologian, and I think he was affiliated at one time anyway with um, Dallas Theological Seminary or with people who are associated with Dallas Theological Seminary, which is kind of a bastion of pre-tribulation theology. Dr. Fruchtenbaum believed that there can be only one literal fulfillment of a prophecy. And I'm going to quote from him now. I'm going to quote from uh, his book, uh, The Footsteps of the Messiah, A Study of the Sequence of Prophetic Events. And I'll leave you the information so you can look at this yourself. This author, that is Dr. Fruchtenbaum is referring to himself, does not accept the validity of the principle of double fulfillment. Double fulfillment law, law <laughs> states that one passage can have a near view and a far view. Hence, in a way, it can be fulfilled two times. 
Okay, this author, that is Dr. Fruchtenbaum, however, does not believe that there is such a thing as double fulfillment. A single passage can refer to one thing only. And if it is prophecy, it can have only one fulfillment, unless the text itself states that it can have many fulfillments. So we know, for example, that the feast days cycle around and that there are multiple aspects to every one of the, the feasts of the Lord. And so those can be fulfilled multiple times as various aspects of each feast are fulfilled at a different moment in time. Because Dr. Fruchtenbaum, who is a pre-tribulation rapture person, <laughs> He believes that you can only have one fulfillment of a prophecy. There is no such thing as double fulfillment. Well, here's the deal. The prophecy about the people of the prince coming in and destroying the city and the sanctuary has already been fulfilled. You can't have it being fulfilled again. There isn't a double fulfillment of the people of the prince coming in and destroying the city and the sanctuary. There cannot be a future far view double fulfillment of the prince who is to come. Verse 26 is not a prophecy of a future antichrist. The prince who is to come was General Titus, who later became the emperor, who sacked Jerusalem in 70 AD. And this prophecy has no double fulfillment, even by the standards of pre-tribulation dispensationalists, who seem to have conveniently forgotten that this is a principle that they hold on to. Verse 27, and he will confirm a covenant with many for one week. Okay, that he goes back to Messiah. Messiah the Prince is the he who will confirm a covenant with many for one week. And in the middle of the week, he'll put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of the temple will come the abomination that causes desolation until the decreed destruction is poured out on him. So traditionally, this is what people have. They have the seven weeks and the 62 weeks, and the one week, okay? So this is 49 plus 434 plus 1 should equal 490 years, okay? But what they do is they put the, a gap right here. And right in the middle here, they put what they call the church age. So this is that 69 weeks of years. Uh, one week of years or seven years and they put a gap right here and they call this the church age so there's 69 weeks and then they have that last week of Daniel's 70th week over here there's one week of years left or seven years and they say that this will start with the Antichrist confirming a covenant. And then there's going to be um, three and a half years. He breaks the covenant. And then there's three and a half years of great tribulation. Okay. And then Jesus returns, the second coming. Okay. And this is seven, seven years right here. They call this Daniel's 70th week. They call this uh, seven years of tribulation. Okay. And uh, this is the church age right here. They have a gap between the 69th and the 70th week. To me, this is artificial because you're creating a gap when there isn't one. There's a, a naturally occurring gap. That's already in the text. That if we would just use it, uh, it will make a whole lot more sense. So there will be seven weeks of years plus 62 weeks of years until Messiah the Prince. So 69 weeks of years or 483 years from the time the decree went forth, counting Shemitah years, would take us to the fall of uh, 27... A.D. and the coming of Christ 
at his first coming in the fall, in the seventh month, at the beginning of the 70th week. Now, we know that Jesus had a three and a half year ministry and he died at Passover three and a half years after he began his ministry. He put an end to sacrifice and offering through his death on the cross. Because the Jews rejected Jesus, the gospel went to the Gentiles. And we have a gap right here. Sacrifice and offering, he put, it, um, put an end to. Okay, and people will say, oh, but sacrifice and offering, what didn't end until, this, until A.D. 70 when the temple was destroyed? Well, not from God's perspective. When Jesus died, the veil in the temple was rent in two. From God's perspective, he was all done with the whole Mosaic system. He was all done with the Old Covenant. Jesus was bringing in or confirming the Abrahamic covenant, the, the covenant God made with the patriarchs. He was, Jesus was confirming with people of faith, people who would believe in him. And he was putting an end to the Mosaic system. Okay, that's that went out. The whole Mosaic system ended when Jesus died. This gap here, I suppose you could call it the church age. I prefer the age of the spirit. And this last group of three and a half years is going to start at the time of the, at the abomination of desolation during the last days. This prophecy in Daniel is about Israel. Okay, so what people tend to do is they want, they want to put us, they want to put believers here in this end time thing. This is for Israel. This is, this is Israel's timeline for their Messiah. His first coming, his second coming. Okay, and then he'll come right here. The gap is already in the 70th week. In the midst of the week, he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. The midst of the week, right there. The, the gap is, is there. It's already there. We already know that the 70th week is divided into two parts. Okay, We know that after 483 years, sabbatical years, after the decree in, uh, I think it was 457 uh, BC, from Artaxerxes Longamanus, or however you say that, um, Plus 483 years brings you to the fall of 27 AD. I don't know how people get around this. Christ arrived after this group of 69 uh, groups of Shemitah years or groups of seven years. Came at the beginning of the 70th Shemitah. During the fall feast in the seventh month of Tishri, exactly as anticipated by first century Jews. He was anointed with the Holy Spirit at his baptism. He confirmed or strengthened the unconditional covenant God had made with the patriarchs. Three and a half years after his baptism, he brought the sacrifices and offerings of the old Mosaic system to rest, which is what that means. It wasn't like he destroyed it. It's like he put it to rest. He put the Mosaic system to rest. It could be over. He did this through the offering of himself on the cross. The veil in the temple was torn in two, and the old covenant became a thing of the past, and Christ ushered in the new covenant with the many, through his blood. So pre-tribulation dispensationalists, along with pre-wrath people, mid-trib, post-tribulationists, all place a gap between the 69th and the 70th week. They put the end of the 69th week in the spring, after Palm Sunday, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. They placed the end of the 69th Shemitah in the month of Nisan, which would begin the next Shemitah cycle in Nisan, the first month of the year, which is not possible. No Shemitah year ever began in the month of Nisan. What every systematic eschatological system has done is they have taken the 70th week of Daniel. They've taken that last week 
and said basically we're not dealing with sab sabbatical years here we don't need to do what the bible says we don't need to treat them the way the jews would have treated them or understand them the way the jews would have understood them we can change the times and seasons and we can have a sabbatical year begin at any time they can bring them begin in the spring it can begin in the winter it doesn't matter whenever that decree went out well that's when we start the shemitah cycles okay you have to understand how arrogant that is and how wrong that is so it's so in error but yet that is what every system has done that has a seven-year tribulation any any eschatology that has a seven-year tribulation is in error they have not thought like a jew they have thought like a gentile they've done what what you know people in good faith you know, errors that people in good faith made, you know, a couple hundred years ago, Sir Robert Anderson and people like him, because they didn't understand the Jewishness of this. But we do. We've got no excuse now. We've got zero excuses for uh, taking uh, and making uh, sabbatical years start at any time. So instead of placing the gap between the 69th and 70th week, there's a far more logical placement of the gap in the midst of the 70th week. This is a naturally occurring separation which already exists in the text. We already know that the 70th week is divided into two parts. The first part was Jesus' first coming, the last half is deals with the Jews prior to Jesus second coming. So the gap would then begin after Jesus crucifixion in the midst of the week, three and a half years after he was anointed. And inside of the gap, we find the age of the spirit during which Christ is building his church stone by living stone. The last half of the 70th week of Daniel will resume at the time of the abomination exactly where Jesus said it would in Matthew 24 and continue for 42 months, 1,260 days or time, times and half a time. All of that equals three and a half years. Okay. So you're probably wondering, why am I talking about this again? I'm talking about this again because time is getting really short and people aren't waking up. <laughs> okay, people are just not waking up. People are blindly going along the same path that they've been on for, you know, decades now. Decades. The whole pre-tribulational, dispensationalist view is in error. It's in error. Okay, and I believe that that believers are going to be in heaven before the abomination of desolation we'll be in heaven before then i believe in that but we get our end time theology not from daniel 9 27 but from the book of revelation okay the book of revelation is going to give us our timeline and it's a lot more detailed we see that the woman flees into the wilderness and then that the dragon begins to pursue the woman's other offspring okay and we know that that's this part right here so we know that parts of daniel are in revelation but the book of revelation does not talk about seven years of tribulation in any place it's not there it just isn't there okay there isn't seven years of tribulation in the book of revelation this was a, a big aha moment for me a, a number of years ago probably about four years ago now when all of a sudden i realized I, and i went looking for anything that would tell me where do people get the idea of seven years of tribulation? And they always went back to here, Daniel 9, 27. And that that 70th week was not going to be fulfilled until the time of the end. So I, there really is a blindness that has settled on the church with regard to Daniel 9, 27 and the prophecy of the 70 weeks. You can go out there and find hundreds of videos talking about Daniel's 70th week, or people will call it the time of Jacob's trouble. But, you know, uh, Jacob's trouble was never said to be um, seven years long. Jacob's trouble has no time associated with it. But we know that 
the Antichrist has three and a half years. We know that the time from the shattering of the holy people until <laughs> it's all over, according to Daniel 12, is time, times, and half a time. We know that the uh, remnant of Israel will be in the wilderness for 1,260 days. This is solid over here. But a seven-year tribulation, and you can't have double fulfillment. Either the people of the prince who was to come destroying the city and the sanctuary was Titus and the Romans, or it wasn't. And if it wasn't, well, that's a different story. But we know that it was. We, we know that Titus came in under the Roman army and destroyed the city and the sanctuary after Jesus uh, was cut off. To make matters worse, people seem to be really blind to the plain teaching of scriptures, even when it's pointed out. Okay, even when I've clearly pointed out and made an argument for this, that is extremely biblical. It's a biblical argument that we're talking about Shemitah years here. And the dates line up between the decree and the first Shemitah cycle that began after Ezra um, entered into the land of uh, Israel and to, to Jerusalem. But even when this is pointed out to people, they are blind. It's like, I can't see this. Well, the problem is that if you believe that what I'm saying here may be true, you're going to have to undo your whole eschatology. You're going to have to redo it all. And most people just don't want to take the trouble or time to do that. They would rather be in error than have to fix it then have to change their thinking, to have to maybe not go along with the tribal thinking that every all their friends and their church members and their family, things that they believe. But I'm just telling you, I'm telling you honestly and from my heart that the idea of a seven-year tribulation coming from Daniel's 70th week is an artificial construct. It's systematic theology. And it originated from good-hearted theologians who didn't understand Shemitah years. It's as simple as that. They didn't understand a Shemitah year. What a group of seven years would mean to a Jewish person. They didn't understand that the 70 Shavua represented 70 groups of sabbatical years and all sabbatical years are connected to the agricultural cycle, which begins in the month of Tishri on Tishri 1. This is the natural, normal interpretation of Daniel 9. Anything else is an artificial construct that has arisen because people did not understand what a Shemitah was. Unfortunately, the times and seasons have indeed been changed not by the Antichrist, but by good-hearted and well-meaning evangelical Christians who refuse to re-evaluate what the 70 Shemitahs of Daniel are all about. And the end times are rapidly approaching, and I believe that we're in the end times. And the seven-year tribulation, um, that whole idea of a seven-year tribulation is in my way of thinking, and you don't have to agree with me, but this is, this is my way of thinking. It's the single fatal flaw in modern eschatology. The seven-year tribulation is a fatal flaw in modern eschatology. And believing in a seven-year tribulation undermines the average believer's ability to interpret other end-time passages in their correct way. Because according to them, everything has to fit into a seven-year tribulation. The 70th week of Daniel, seven years total. So my question is this, why? Have we abandoned the normal Hebraic understanding of Shavua or sabbatical or Shemitah years? And how is it that we believe that the sabbatical years can actually begin on a non-biblical date? So this is my plea. Please, please be willing to look at something different. Please be willing to reevaluate your eschatology, especially when your eschatology is based on something that people came up with a long time ago who didn't have an understanding of the whole Hebraic 
culture and the feasts and the symbolism and the Shemitah cycles. They didn't know how to fit that into Daniel's 70th week. And so when they uh, read about from the time that the decree is issued until uh, Messiah the Prince, they take it directly from um, March or April, Nisan 1, whatever, whenever it was that Artaxerxes issued that decree in the spring, and they begin the Shemitah count in the spring. Okay, this is the fatal flaw. You have to actually wait until the fall to Shri 1 after that decree was issued, and then you can begin your count. What that means is that the 70th week of Daniel has to always begin in the fall, <laughs> okay? Every one of those 70 weeks of years is going to begin in the fall. Every single one of them will begin in the seventh month, the seventh Hebrew month of Tishri. Every one of them. And they will all end on the last day of Elul, thus and, uh, ushering in the next cycle of years uh, on, a, um, you know, on Tishri 1. So, I, you know, I'm really passionate about this because one of the things that I've seen is that people are hungry for the truth. People are hungry to know where we're at in the end times. But if they are basing their eschatology on something that's not true, if the seven-year tribulation, 70th week of Daniel is not true, and I'm giving you enough information to hopefully show you that there is the potential that that isn't a thing, <laughs> that there's only three and a half years left, then the whole system comes crumbling down. The whole pre-tribulation rapture system comes tumbling down. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't a rapture before the seals um, or trumpets or bowls or anything like that. There, there definitely is. And we do see people in Revelation 4 that are believers sitting around God's throne represented by the 24 elders. But there isn't going to be seven years and there isn't going to be an antichrist confirming a covenant at the beginning of a seven-year cycle. It just isn't going to happen because that guy has already been here. His name is Titus, and he brought in the Romans. All right, so um, I'm leaving you with uh, the link to some articles. I'm leaving you with my show notes. I'm leaving you with this video, and hopefully I'm leaving you to reconsider some of the things that you may have believed in the past. So till the next video, I pray you'll have a very, very blessed day.